Hello, everyone. My name is Molly Dubin, and I am the curator of the Jewish Museum Milwaukee. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's presentation, Jewish Work for Social Justice and Racial Equality, Our Responsibility to Engage. And this program is taking place in connection with our current exhibit, Luba Lukova, Designing Justice. So I ask for everyone's patience with any technical glitches that may occur this evening. For those of you enjoying this program through Zoom, if you have any technical challenges during the talk, please use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And one of our program team will attempt to help you. Also, please submit questions via that chat feature as well. And we will be pulling from these questions for our Q&A after the presentation. To get the best experience possible from the program this evening, we are going to recommend that you view the program in the speaker view. So if you are currently seeing the Brady Bunch style gallery view, you can select the speaker view option, which is located in the top right hand corner of your screen. So I know that many of you have already made a donation to support this program and other virtual programs uh, that we have offered over the past many months. And we thank you for those contributions. If you haven't yet and you are able to, we ask that you make a donation to JMM so that we can continue to offer these exciting, engaging and, and very relevant uh, programs and discussions during this difficult ongoing time. We will share a uh, donation link in the chat box at the end of the program. So before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors for this specific program. Uh, I would like to thank Congregation Beth Israel Nair Tamid's Social Action Committee, Congregation Emmanuel Beneja Shuren, Congregation Sinai, Ron Miller and Susan Angel Miller, Takun Hayer, and the Jewish Community Relations Council of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation. I would also like to thank our committee members who were instrumental in helping us put together such a slate of meaningful programs and particularly the, the program we are, going to, uh, we are going to embark on this evening. So I know several of you are in attendance. Thank you for that. With everything that has transpired in our world and in our country, it feels as if it was several lifetimes ago that we first reached out to Ruth about doing this program and then subsequently needing to postpone it due to the pandemic. And as we convene this evening, we find ourselves again navigating unprecedented circumstances. So with that in mind, it is truly my pleasure and honor to introduce our presenter, Ruth Messinger. Ruth is the global ambassador of American Jewish World Services, an international human rights and development organization, which she ran from 1998 through 2016. Ruth does social justice and organizing work as the activist in residence at the Marlene Meyerson JCC, as the Finkelstein Institute Social Justice Fellow at the Jewish Sociological, excuse me, at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. She has just completed development of a social justice curriculum for Melton Schools and teaches the webinar program for women entrepreneurs at the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York. Please welcome Ruth Messinger. Thanks so very, very much, Molly. And thanks to all of you who are on Zoom in some fashion and with sadness and apologies. I know I know a few of you. I know I had the privilege of meeting some of you when I was speaking in Milwaukee, it seems like a lifetime ago. And so I'm sorry, I can't see you all. And I hope some of you will ask questions so that I can make the connections or you can remind me of the connections that I should be making. Um, I'm, let me just say now I'm going to speak. I'm gonna say a little bit about the process of getting this particular speech ready. Um, but I think that in order to do justice to the topic, and particularly to the subhead, which is the responsibility to engage, um, we will do our best work um, in question and answer. So I'm urging you to 
of course, pay attention, pay attention, but think about some of the questions you want to ask so that when we um, go to questions, um, I can really find new ways to engage with each of you. I start now by asking you to join me in paying deep respect to the Ojibwe, the Oneida, and the Lenape people who originally occupied the lands of Milwaukee, where you are, and New York, where I am. I thank them for stewarding the land and waters that now support us in what was their ancestral homeland. This practice of acknowledging former inhabitants of the land is now common practice in Australia and New Zealand, and it's beginning to gain a foothold in the United States. It is a way to say that we are all products of conflict over land and borders, and we can only do better going forward if we acknowledge the past. That said, we meet at an extraordinary and challenging moment, one that is so much more critical than even when I accepted the invitation from Molly and Cassie several months ago. At that time, as we were talking about tonight, I referred to the ongoing health pandemic and the consequent economic crisis and to the fact that the pandemic has exposed, as you all know, severe racial fault lines in healthcare, and the fact that we have seen horrendous recent explosions of race-based violence, facts that I continue to believe we must address. That was then, many months ago, and it remains our reality now. It was a key piece of what I hope to speak with you about tonight. And I very much want it to continue to be on your and my agenda. But those continuing challenges don't begin to speak to where we find ourselves after the last 48 hours. And I, as a person, I am a product of time and events deeply moved and shaken by what has occurred since Tuesday. It shapes my remarks tonight, and I wanna tell you in advance that it makes those remarks more raw and more intense than either my hosts or I might have intended. So please, take a deep breath. Really, take a deep breath. And then let's look at the good news and the bad news. First, the election in Georgia. I wanna say in my mind that this is not a partisan comment. Regardless of which candidates you might have supported in Georgia, a runoff election in which the turnout was almost as high as in the general election, something that never happens, an election in which an unprecedented number of young people participated, and an election in which, the, whether or not they were your candidates, the state will send to Washington, state of Georgia, will send to Washington its first black senator and will also send a Jew steeped in his own traditions is worthy of note. It is for sure, that is the election, a tribute to the importance of protecting the voting rights of every person in this country, making it easier not harder to cast a vote. And we know, all of us, firsthand how much work that requires in Wisconsin, in New York, in Georgia, just about every place. And also, the election in Georgia on Tuesday is a tribute to the power of grassroots organizing and coherent leadership provided most visibly in this instance by Stacey Abrams. In my mind, this is a positive marker for our democracy, and one I hope we won't forget, despite what has happened before and since. Because at the same time, you and we had the aftermath of the shooting in Kenosha and the renewed need for the nation to focus on gun violence, on police community relations, on police accountability, and on the capacity of our criminal justice systems to deal with this and similar episodes. 
And then came yesterday, which already feels, I don't know, like several days ago, like it didn't hardly happen, like it's still overwhelming me, all of those things at once. A moment in which angry crowds were urged to mark on our capital by our president, in which, and again, I am really striving here for the maximum degree of, of the maximum degree of objectivity that I can muster, a physical citadel and symbol of our 250 year old democracy was under siege. Terrorists destroyed property, at least one life was lost and our elected representatives were in real physical danger. Okay, I'm not gonna dwell on this much longer, except to note, as I feel I must, that during this attempted coup, and that is what I choose to call it, the attackers brought not only weapons, but Confederate flags, giant crosses, and Nazi imagery into the Capitol building. Organize their protest around their belief in white supremacy. And at least one elected official and several demonstrators evoked Hitler as a leader. Also, my last point specifically about yesterday, it now seems clear and clearly absurd that there was inadequate or perhaps no preparation by the Capitol Police and other enforcement officers for what was certainly likely to occur. And that nothing these officials did bore any relationship to how we have seen police respond to demonstrations throughout this country by people of color. Enough. You will each process these events, Georgia, Kenosha, Washington, in your own way, sometimes agreeing with me and sometimes disagreeing. And I think certainly with regard to yesterday, we need to also each acknowledge that we haven't, we have barely begun to process what we saw, to understand it and to think it through in the ways that I'm hoping we will. So those are my comments that caused me to rewrite a whole piece of this speech this afternoon about the last 48 hours. But the theme of tonight's talk remains the same, spoken in many ways at many times in our history. Here, my choice, as articulated by a life hero of mine, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Heschel wrote, in a free society where terrible wrongs exist, some are guilty, but all are responsible. I'm gonna to choose to say that again. In a free society where terrible wrongs exist, some are guilty, but all are responsible. 15 words, but that is my mantra and my message. The privilege of living in a democracy, the privilege of no longer being an enslaved people, the further privilege for some of us of our whiteness or our professional position or our economic standing or our citizenship or our access to resources is that we must acknowledge our responsibility and commit to action. You know, we talk often about being the people of the book. We talk often and we tell endless stories about the rabbis committed to study. But I hope many of you know that among the many discussions, disputes and debates that the rabbis had was one in which the question was, which is more important, study or action? Some said study was important, some said action was imp more important. And the conclusion was that study was more important because it leads to action. And that's where I wanna be sure that we all understand ourselves, that it is not 
only what we see, what we hear, and what we learn, as important as those are, it is what we do with what we see and what we hear and what we learn. We have texts. We actually have texts galore. I mean, you know that in the Torah, in rabbinic commentary, in Parsha analyses, in contemporary writings, sometimes from people of other faiths, telling us what I'm saying, telling us that we must act, that we must lean in, that we must do the actual work of pursuing justice. There is a sheet, and I'm gonna ask uh, Cassie to bring it up on the screen now. You do not have to spend the next 20 minutes reading it. There is a sheet with some small sampling of text quotes. Um, we're gonna screen share it, but more importantly, it's gonna get posted and be available to you. So you don't need to read it through now. Let me say that again, when I started to prepare these remarks and we talked, and I think in the, in the blurb that it says that I would be talking, it says we will do some text analysis. But you know, folks, that's really hard to do um, when we're not together. If we were in a room, you know, if you were in an auditorium, I would have arranged to put these up on a screen or even better to give out copies. I would have urged you to talk to, uh, with your neighbors, to put together small groups in the room of two, three, four, five people and look at some of the quotes and discuss them with each other because that is the way, the way Jews study and the ways in which um, education professionals will tell us it's a good way to learn. But I can't do that because I don't know what situation, what your current situation is. And I'm sure that some of you are with other people, but that some of you are not. So I'm gonna just do much less actual looking at these texts as I talk. Um, I, will, I will zero in on a few of them, um, but instead I'm gonna talk a bit more about what I think we're being called on to do and then, as I said before, take your questions. And if there's time later, we can come back and look at some of these texts. I would just note that these are among my most favorite because I have like five pages of texts that I use often. And I have a three page handout. And then for tonight, I tried to boil it down to things that I thought you might find most useful. I have one other caveat. And that is that the blurb for tonight suggested that I would talk about some global issues, referencing the ongoing and really exciting work of American Jewish World Service. It's work about which I am passionate. But given the real world situation, I decided this afternoon that I would focus my opening remarks locally. Although I will be happy to take any questions later about global human rights, about the status of LGBTQ rights around the world, about something that's gotten painfully little coverage so far, and that is what's happening with the COVID pandemic in the rest of the world, about the issue of immigration, which is a particular passion of mine, and I had the good fortune to speak about it in Milwaukee the last time I was there, or about the current genocide in Burma and the genocidal and ethnic cleansing efforts elsewhere in the world. So those are all up and open for your questions. But what I wanna do now is go back to Heschel. And I wanna say, I wanna ask us, what does it mean to accept responsibility? So let's go back to some of the issues that I mentioned right up front. Probably no one in this audience, I obviously don't know you all, but probably no one in this audience is a person who's charged with the training of our various police forces. But we all know that that is an issue. We are, most of us, not in charge of making healthcare less racist, at least not directly. But we know that it has to be done. We are not in most of these areas personally guilty for something that is clearly inequitable and unjust, but we have to accept responsibility for the fact that it exists. And in accepting responsibility, we have to decide what it is we should do. To go even further down this road, many of us 
said, probably some of you, probably me at some point in the last, I don't know what hours, 20 hours, said that we were shocked by yesterday's events. And we were, but we also knew at some level that things were getting increasingly dangerous. Again, we were not guilty of doing things directly in most instances, but we were responsible. We didn't cause most of us, most of the time, any or all of these problems, although for sure there are problems that any one of us may cause that we are then directly responsible for. But we didn't cause these large social problems, but we are not, and this is Jewish teaching, we are not free to ignore them. We have an obligation to be upstanders, not bystanders, to figure out why and how to take responsibility and to act for our own and for the greater good. We need to learn, I think that's probably not the right word, I think we know, but we need to remind ourselves to look into the root causes of the problems that are defining our era and consider the myriad ways in which we can and must be involved as individuals and as Jews in the ongoing struggles for justice and equity. We do live in a democracy, or as Ben Franklin said, when he was asked if the founding fathers were building a republic or a monarchy, he said, a republic, if you can keep it. That is our job. It is our job dramatically after this week. What do we need to do to keep and to improve this Republic? To never again see threatened our historic commitment for a peaceful transition of transfer of power. It is our job to protect this Republic. To me, that means leaning in. It means acknowledging our role in strengthening voting rights. It means picking elected officials whom we believe will engage directly in making social change on our behalf. It means sticking with unpopular causes and organizing with others, whether in our synagogue community, through the museum, in any of the other organizations where we spend our time to pursue the changes that are needed. It means listening to and learning from others what safeguards are not in place that should be and organizing to create those. And again, that's true in which other ever area you choose. I'm talking a little bit about the fundamental protections for our democracy, but I talked about the quality of health care. I talked about the issues of gun violence. I called, talked about the issues of police accountability the issues of police training. There are lots and lots of choices. So the most important thing I'm gonna to say tonight to each of you is you cannot do it all. Nobody can pick up on each of these issues and then figure out what to do and try to take on issue after issue because you will collapse in exhaustion. And at the same time, we cannot retreat to the convenience of being overwhelmed. What do I mean by that? I mean that all of us, starting with me, you know, get up some mornings, look at a headline, sit and look at the television yesterday, um, hear one more painful story and say, really, it's too much. I want to turn off the news. I feel overwhelmed. So I'm not saying you can't feel that way. I'm not saying that, or I'm saying affirmatively, that every one of us will despair at some different points. But despair is not a strategy. And again, we can't retreat to the convenience of simply saying we're overwhelmed. What we cannot do, most particularly, speaking this week, is to say that January 6th, 2021 was an aberration and it won't happen again. That would be forfeiting on the responsibilities that Ben Franklin and Rabbi Heschel told us to take up. So you know that when rabbis speak, I'm not a rabbi, but I get to speak in a lot of synagogues and at a lot of Jewish organizations, 
And magically, I discovered that whatever the Parsha, the portion of the week is, for years, for the 18 years I was at American Jewish World Service, magically, every week the Parsha was about global social justice. And magically, the Parsha for this week speaks precisely to the issues we're talking about in multiple ways. In synagogue this week, people will read Shmot, which is the first chapter of the book of Exodus. I know you are all intimately familiar with it and could just start right now by reciting it. But in case that's not the, the case, let me just say, what we see is Moshe, Moses, standing up for others, standing up for Jews and non-Jews. But we also see him being asked by God to lean in. Just what I'm asking each of you to do to lean in, to take leadership responsibility. And Moses is more than reluctant. He turns down the request many times because he knows, as do each of us, that it is going to be hard, not always rewarding, and for sure that it will be slow going. Ultimately, if you remember the story, Moses accepts responsibility and guess what? It turns out that it's not ever easy. People complain, things don't go the way he hopes. That's why for each of us, as we think about leaning in, as you think about the issues that are most important to you, I'm urging you, take some time, even if you think you've done this already, take some time in light of the issues that I'm raising tonight, in the light of the issues that are most on your mind, in light of whether those issues are national issues or Milwaukee issues or issues that particularly affect your family, find your particular niche, create slowly your own support system so you are not doing this work alone, educate and organize with others, become organizers who have resilience and determination and vision and a good deal of moral courage. And do not forget self-care. You can't do this work of pushing for social change if you can't learn to take care of yourself, to be nice to yourself. And part of what I think, again, after yesterday is to the degree that you were shocked or upset, or felt guilty, or felt responsible, or felt angry, or felt confused. For any one of those emotions, they are all legitimate emotions. Take the time to understand how you're feeling, to speak with others and see how they're feeling, and to then figure out what it will take for you, for each one of us, to find those magical ways to move forward and to make a difference. One other note about the Parsha, which a rabbi, a former rabbi of mine pointed out to me in a mailing that he sent out this week. We read this week in the Parsha, in the section of the Torah, that Moses saw the burning bush. The commentators point out that it is not just that he saw the bush, it is that he saw that it was on fire, but was not being consumed by the fire. And that's when he realized that it was no ordinary bush, um, you know, where someone had dropped a lighted cigarette, that there was some divine force involved and some divine message being sent to him. But what do I take out of that? I take out of that the exhortation to myself and to each of you that we need to pay more attention to what is happening around us, not just see it, but strive to give it more than passing attention to understand what the events of our week or our, of our year have to tell us. As I said earlier, the texts taken together tell us over and over that this is our responsibility to see, to learn from what we see, to act because we have the capacity to make the world a better place and to make informed change because we can. So before I close and move to take your questions, I do wanna look at one text. So um, if you can put the text back up, Cassie. 
Um, it's the next to the last test text. Um, so it's on the second page. And why am I picking that? Because I will tell you honestly that very often when I talk or when people that I'm speaking with think that I'm overdoing my message, they say to me that I'm just picking from Heschel or from Elie Wiesel or from Martin Luther King, that I'm focused on like the last hundred years and I'm pursuing my own 21st century version of urging others to help heal the world. So it's for that reason that I want to share with you the wise words of a famous and famous Torah commentary from Mishpatim. I'm gonna read it, but you can obviously read it yourselves as well. If a person of learning, that's all of you folks, people established in their communities. If a person of learning participates in public affairs and serves as judge or arbiter, they give stability to the land. But if they sit in their home and say to themselves, what have the affairs of state to do with me? Why should I trouble myself with the people's voices of protest? We've all said things like that. Let my soul dwell in peace. And then Mishpatim, the Torah commentary says, if one does this, they overthrow the world. So our sages could not be clearer, folks, than to opt out, to decide that because we didn't cause a problem, we're not responsible to address it, is literally, although it may feel like doing nothing, it's literally doing something. It's contributing to the spread of problems. It's contributing to the overthrow of the world. So before the world is overthrown, we need each of us to continue the work that we're doing or to get to work. And the good news is that we're meeting at a time just in that cycle of the year when the days are getting longer and when there is more light coming into our lives. We need that light and we need to share it with others, maximizing the opportunities for all of us to move toward justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Wow. Um, thank you so much for, uh, you know, setting the stage for this discussion. As, as you said, and I said earlier, you know, it seems that so many lifetimes have passed since we, we first discussed, you know, doing this program and, and, you know, and even since here we are, yes, since yesterday, that, uh, you know, you, you felt compelled and, and rightly so to, to reshape some thoughts in terms of yesterday's events. So with that, I know we have um, a lot of people in the audience who I'm sure have questions and want to uh, delve a little bit deeper into some of the things that you've talked about. Good. So um, if people have questions and, and can submit them into the chat, that would be Terrific, and we'll watch that. Um, to get us going, I'd like to ask, and and you touched on this when when we started speaking, and you know certainly in the wake of everything that's happened, you know we, we had identified you know topics that we wanted to address in connection with the Designing Justice exhibit. Um, you know, we certainly throughout the many months have seen, as you mentioned, the pandemic and, you know, the disproportionate impact on people of color, on communities that are already struggling with some fundamental civil rights issues and have been struggling, um, you know, to go through everything that we've seen, you know, the spring, the summer into, you know, and here we are just at the beginning of the new year, and yesterday's events and um, very fittingly, we saw a lot of commentary and we all thought, I, I, I did certainly, and I'm sure many others did too, that were watching it take place, how differently, <laughs> how different the response would have been had that been a mob of color. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on kind of what possibly the thinking was in the preparation or lack thereof of preparation um, and the difference in, in the mentality involved in that. 
Well, you know, I can't get inside people's heads. I'm actually astounded. I, I did a, um, once a month, I do a kind of politics, politics 101 Q and A with the, with the seniors at the JCC. They're not, they're not very senior. I mean, since I'm older than most of them, but anyway, it's the senior program. But we were having a discussion about, this is before yesterday, we were, we were having a discussion about the election and the um, many, 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 many tweets about the election and accusations about the election. And one of the people asked, um, should we expect um, violence in Washington on uh, January 6th? And I said, look, I don't have a crystal ball, but I have to assume that there will be street demonstrations and I said, I have to assume that they will be ready for them. You know, and um, hopefully there's not a recording of that discussion, but I remember what I said. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an example of what I'm talking about. No, I don't think, Molly, that I was supposed to wake up even after that woman asked that, that I was supposed to go home and say, oh my God, I wonder what kind of preparations the mayor of Washington or the head of the Capitol Police um, are making. Um, but somebody had to do it. And so this actually to go back to the to the Heschel quote, you know, what I was what I emphasized in the Heschel quote is that even if you were not guilty in the sense that you didn't create the problem, you have a responsibility to address it. But now I'm going to say something a little different, and that is we each have to figure out in the areas of our professional work or our um, community activity or our expertise, what should we be aware of? And it's not just, oh my God, there could be a serious demonstration. Are we prepared? Um, although we all know about that. It's, it's like, what could we be doing affirmatively? You know, again, I don't, I don't um, know the people on this call, but someone, as I said, nobody, nobody listening today has probably did anything deliberate to create, to pick up the issue that you mentioned, Maui, racial disparities in healthcare in Milwaukee or in the United States. But we know now that there's a set of reasons. I don't even think we know every reason why communities of color are being more heavily hit by the, by the pandemic. So I will say, if you are, are in the healthcare um, field and you're somebody who's absorbing this message that I'm trying to give, that as a person, as a citizen, as a Jew, you have a set of responsibilities. Think about what you could contribute by saying, wait a minute, are we prepared? Wait a minute. Um, there was an excellent article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine this past week that made an obvious point. When I say an obvious point, you know, a point is when you read something and you say, oh, shoot, I should have thought of that myself. So it just said like, okay, we have categories for vaccination. And by the way, folks, I'm sort of miss, I'm, paraphrasing the article, by the way, these categories don't make sense in that they're not clear. So you say healthcare workers, first category, but how do you weigh the researcher who is connected to a healthcare institution, but is doing all her work all the time right now at home because of the pandemic and never sees another person how do you compare and contrast that person's right to a vex to the vaccine with the janitor in the hospital? And there's a thousand questions like that. And if you're part of doing that work, but it's not just healthcare inequities. I guess the way I'm going to say this differently is, um, and I'm strayed from your question because I don't know why they did not, why they were not better prepared at every level. I do know, and now I'm, um, None of us saw everything. And so now I'm passing on an observation from my family at the dinner table tonight. It's not something I saw directly, but members of my family said that they saw on the videos, members of the Capitol Police just standing aside and letting the mob enter. And the question is, I don't know the answer. Was that a, a, an affinity? They thought it was great to come in and take over the Capitol? Was that that they were not prepared to know what to do? Was that that they were themselves frightened? I have no idea what the answer is. But I want to repeat what I said in the speech. Anyone who says, and we're all capable of doing this, including, I'm sorry to mention his name, I don't mean to be mean, but including Joe Biden. He's like who has 4,000 issues on his plate starting on January 21st. We don't want any of those people to say, oh, this was an aberration. It will not happen again. 
So. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and I understand. I, um, we have a question here and that this somewhat- well, Molly, just one, one quick addition. Look what's happened today. The Sergeant at Arms resigned and the Pelosi has asked the head of the Capitol Police to resign and I gather that he will. So that tells me something. A lot of things were going on in people's heads that make no sense. Right. So, you know, somewhat in, in connection with, with what we're talking about here and, um, you know, the thoughts on, you know, maybe we would have expected that might have looked differently, that response um, in consideration of everything that we have been witness to, uh, certainly with all the protests that began surrounding, uh, you know, George Floyd's death. So the question is, how has the, the racial justice protests of this past summer changed the social justice work that you are involved in? Um, um, significantly. So I want to answer first from a personal point of view. Um, I have um, um, people of color in my family. Um, and so I, on the one hand, these issues have been, some aspects of these issues have been clear to me for a long time. And on the other hand, that means that I have family members, I'm going to choose not to identify their exact relationship to me, who tell me all the time that I'm not doing enough, that I don't understand enough, that I'm not the person raising um, children of color. Um, and if I were the person or if I were better at who I think I am, I would be more sensitive to these issues. So I actually have that. I mean, I consider it fortunate that I have it because I could drive me crazy, but it's a reminder that we all put blinders on. But on the broader question, which is how you asked it, um, I think I've pushed in the various organizations that I work in, um, which you heard were various, um, to be sure that um, we're considering issues of race, both inside the institution um, who works in this institution? What are their connections to each other? That's one aspect. Two is the particular aspect that's alive and been people have been talking a lot about recently, and that is the presence, but sometimes the tendency to ignore the presence of Jews of color who are a significant part of our community. But three is, I'm saying, in sort of anything and everything that we do, so I no longer run American Jewish World Service. It's run by my distinguished um, former executive vice president, Robert Bank. But at the same time as Robert is overseeing the staff that works, as I mentioned before, on international issues of human rights, um, he has um, a, 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 what's it called? What's the D stand for? DEI, um, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer, which we didn't have before and has a um, diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant firm that's helping people look at inside the organization, what do we all need to know about issues of race? And as we do our work in the world, what do we need to know about issues of race? So I would say that I've moved it increasingly front and center in the organization. As the organizations I work for have moved it front and center, and I've done that myself. In this past summer, um, at the Jewish Theological Seminary where I work, um, even in the presence of COVID, my associate who is the, my associate, is the associate dean of the rabbinical school and the head of the Hendel Center for Equity and Justice, um, put together a group that was specifically called something like, sorry, I do it, like, let's, let's talk, let's, let's talk, read and discuss so we can act. So it was, it was don't hear about racism, see the murder of George Floyd and form a book club. Don't do that. It doesn't mean you shouldn't read. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have a group that discusses what you read, but do it with the notion that you wanna talk about what's happening in the collective lives of the people in that room and that you wanna figure out what actions you should be taking to create um, to create, it's a negative way of saying it, but to create less racism, to create a more equitable organization. Thank you. So um, we have several more questions that have come in. Um, this one, uh, 
goes back to kind of uh, the text that you began talking about and the, the serendipity of, of the, you know, the Parsha in terms of the theme. So that Parsha Shmot has a theme of survival of Jews in Judaism. Um, you know, looking at institutionalized anti-Judaism of, you know, supremacists, universities, um, members of Congress, et cetera. How do we combat that? How do we, how do we survive? Uh, so this is, um, you know, you could have had someone else really good speak tonight about this issue. Um, I'm just going to say, I think this is, a, I'm sorry, I'm not getting to see your exhibit, but I think this is a piece of, I would like to hope that this is a piece of work of the museum. Now, when I say this, what do I mean? I mean that it's a big effort, what we were talking about at the Jewish Theological Seminary. It's a big effort in the society in which we live, in which on the one hand, any one of us is more than one thing, okay? We have a gender, we have a sexual orientation, we have a race, we have a class, we, are, we, are, we have those multiple identities, but when the society talks, it separates out um, racism from homophobia, from um, anti-Semitism. And when I say we have a task, I think the task now, not, not that came to light yesterday, but that's come to light in the last few years, is to understand that the people who are promoting um, their own different versions of white nationalism and white supremacy, that that is at the root of a great deal of contemporary anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-racism, that it's basically a lot of it is being advanced by people whose fundamental belief um, is that whites should rule the world. Um, there's lots of there's lots being written and spoken about this. I just the person who quickly comes to mind is Eric Ward, um, but I think that that that's a task for all of us because it's not the way we're trained to think. And by the way, half the people in this audience have at some point in their lives been in a discussion in which somebody said something like, I think the treatment of black people is appalling, whether it's by the police or in the schools or in your office. And to which a rejoinder has been like, yeah, that's true, but I'm concerned about anti-Semitism. So I mean, we've all heard those conversations. So we've all participated in those conversations and there's nothing wrong with them. But what a powerful piece of new learning and understanding it, it, it can be just to realize that the people promoting those agendas are very often the same people with the same fundamental ideology, which is that white should rule the world. Okay. And that extends to white, Christian, straight people very quickly. Okay, uh, well, we're gonna segue right in the, you know, the, the idea of agenda uh, is a, a good word, a fitting word. Several of the next questions have to do with fighting conspiracy theories you know we we have these you know people in in office that are pushing you know lies and alternative truths um how do we fight conspiracy theories okay. and lies which have become so, so widespread again, i'm trying to not to imagine or pretend that i have the i knew that i knew that particular i know that you're i know you had a good audience and i knew that you were lining me up for some questions, but I also knew that after what's gone on this week, you know, there are going to be questions that I don't know all the answers to. Um, but I want to say a couple of things. Um, this notion of people believing their own truths is terrifying. It's a very simple quote, I think, I think from Winston Churchill, but I'm not sure. So please do not quote me. Look it up. You can Google it which is that um, everyone um, can have their own opinion, but nobody can have their own facts. So there's a piece of, and one of the things I would say that you need to do, and it's again, it fits to my statement that we can't do, no one, no one of us can do all of it. In something that you really care about, know the facts, okay? In New York City, where I'm still connected to New York City politics, I know, I'm saying this but deliberately because it will, awe the people, I mean, it will appall, not awe, the people of Milwaukee. Um, we have 100,000 children who are quote, unquote, 
learning remotely who have no broadband access or no laptops, 100,000 children. Now we're a big city. We have 1.1 million children in our public school system, but people go through their day sort of minimizing that problem. And unless you say on every occasion, it's 100,000 children, you can't begin to get people to think about the impact, the, the consequences of the solution. So what I'm saying is if your area is, um, is gun violence, you know, find a reputable organization. You probably are already connected one if that's your area, but learn some of the facts and learn where those facts are borne out. Okay, I, now I'm talking about something I don't know anything about in Wisconsin, but how many guns are brought into Wisconsin that are bought in other states? Um, what efforts have been made to stop that? What happens when you do a, a buy guns in a, in a neighborhood? These are all different things, but learn the facts so that when you say something and somebody then, as you say, as the questioner says, puts forward their own version of the truth, at least I'm, can, can I, I can't answer the question, how can you be sure to change their minds? I can say that you're correct, the questioner, but there are alternative facts that one of the crises that we're facing in this country over the growing last decade or two is that people increasingly get their news, quote unquote, from news sources that tell them what they want. Um, and a lot of that um, are not facts. Now, since I'm your speaker and since you know everybody is allowed to ride their own horse, I'm gonna say, here's a simple thing to do and that is, again, I don't know the state of affairs in Milwaukee, but we don't teach civics. So most of the people on this call are, my wild guess, are over 40. And you studied, we studied some version of this, that, and the other about how is the government put together. And that doesn't happen anymore. And so when people storm state houses and say we're out to kidnap the governor, or when people, you know, people have not a clue what they're talking about. I've developed a role at the JCC in which, um, um, thank you, somebody said it's Henry Jackson, not Winston Churchill. Thank you, it's Henry Jackson. Thank you. Um, you know, and when I when I actually, we teach a course at the JCC called um, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About City Government But Were Afraid to Ask. Mm. And that's because informed people think they know how New York City government is put together. New York City has actually some very weird things in its government structure and people have no idea. The positions they vote for, they have no idea what is exactly the power of that person. So it would be good if, um, you know, the museum undertook a, a, some demonstration, um, I don't mean that, some exhibit a year from now, you know, in conjunction with your local public school system and with some other museums that said, you know, let's talk about who's the boss of Milwaukee. How do things get put together? What does it mean when you go to vote? I mean, it's anything like that, but we don't, uh, it's an underlying issue because I don't feel adequate to tell you what the solution is to um, Fox News versus MSNBC or how to, how to break down some of those barriers. I do know that we don't teach in our, even our, some of our best schools, we don't give people the tools they need to find the difference between fact and opinion. Thank you, and and I appreciate. I, I know you you're, you're being uh, you're fielding some questions that. No, this is great. No, no, keep them coming. Maybe beyond uh, you know the pale here, but so appreciate your you know your your commenting and responding to these. So this next question really brings us back, I think, to what so many of us and certainly people on the committee involved with the exhibit and the programming were thinking um, when wanting to do this, one of, you know, the justice, repairing the world, you know, the, these are some of the, the fundamental tenets of Judaism. Um, certainly, you know, very much these are, are issues, um, you know, immigration, other things that have long been, you know, part of the Jewish consciousness and in, in dealing with with social justice and in terms of, of action um but again you know we've seen unprecedented things um we're shifting in a, in many different ways how do we as jews convince other jews that it's important to work toward causes beyond just what concerns us 
beyond anti-Semitism, beyond Israel. And, and this goes to some of the very poignant uh, quotes that, that you shared. Yeah, I think some of it is in those quotes. I love some of those quotes. I love, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm partial to women and I love having five years ago met the, um, Rosalie Bella, who is the, um, the Supreme Court Justice in Canada. And she's quoted on, a, on this document, the three key issues of human rights are that indifference is the incubator of injustice, that it's not what you stand for, it's what you stand up for, and that people must never forget how the world looks to the vulnerable. So, okay, so, but let's the answer to that question. So how do you, can first of all, <laughs> this is an issue, folks. I am not saying you will convince your curmudgeonly uncle or the woman next to you at, at a place of work or someone right in your synagogue, because I know what people say, but this is an issue on which Judaism could not be clearer and says 37 times in the Torah, take care of the needs of the other and the stranger because you were once the stranger. You know, some people, not all of the people that people are talking to, but some people have their own powerful family stories. Um, some are, are Holocaust slash survivor stories, but some are just immigration stories. Who helped your family? Who got you out of Warsaw the day before Kristallnacht? Who are those people? We know who those people are in, um, in the, at, um, who are righteous Gentiles. You know, Jews were saved by people who were not Jewish. So I get to tell a little story here related to that. Um, there's a wonderful book. The book is called Conscience and Courage. It's by a social psychologist named Eva Fogelman. And Eva Fogelman sent out, I'm sure the book is 10 years old, to talk to people who had been rescuers during the Holocaust um, and ask them what motivated them. And a lot of her interviews, people said, what do you mean what motivated me? I did what any human being would have done. And she would say to them, no, no, that is not true. You know, you have a farm. The person who has the farm down the road from you was an um, SS commandant and you nevertheless hid a Jewish family under the floorboards in your barn and went out and fed them every morning. Like what made you do that in the face of this obvious risk? And as I said, she had to really push to find out, get people to understand that they had done something great that not everybody would do. So why did I tell you that story? Because at the end of the book tours, the book, what do you call it? The book when Eva was on book tour, when she would speak about the book, you know, and an author then takes questions. And at the end of her presentations, she would say, well, we're about to, we're about finished. But when some of you come up to talk to me afterwards, I know that what you're gonna say to me is, I can't imagine what I would have done in that circumstance. And she said, if you say that to me, I'm going to say to you, the question is not what you would have done in that circumstance. The question is, what are you doing today? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the kid notion or the movie notion, pay it forward. Someone actually, in many of our families, somebody actually saved somebody and kept them alive. And how can we begin, which we know happens all the time, to turn our back on someone who needs our help? Because that's literally, we, for many of us, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for those amazing stories. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, and then I talked a little bit about this in the speech and I, I realized to the questioner that this is not a popular thing to say to the people who are bugging you. But you know, some of it is we, we have to start being able to talk about being people of privilege. Because part of the answer to this is, why should we do those things? Because we can. Because we are in a position when, um, I'm gonna keep imagining Milwaukee as a town I know some more about than I do. But when too many people are out of work because of the combination of the pandemic and businesses shutting down because of the pandemic in New York City, I feel like we're gonna lose every restaurant. But every time a restaurant goes under, it's a huge bunch of people many of them um, immigrants who lose their jobs and then become food insecure. 
So if you, for some of you, that may be your current situation. You may be losing your job. You may be waiting to see if the stimulus is going from 600 to 2000, which I believe it will very quickly. Um, but for others of you, remember what I said. Remember what I said about the burning bush. Don't, I'll be very specific. Don't drive past a line of people in Milwaukee on a street corner without finding out why they're lined up. And what are they looking for? And what is the problem? And what could you do about it? And if you don't want to, as it were, give someone food, then contribute to a, um, an organization that's fighting for um, uh, a fair wage. Or think about how to get involved, but don't not see. And I, I understand that, 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 that what I'm saying doesn't work easily with the kind of people that the question was about. But, but we are told the most important thing we can do is help others and strangers because that is the story of our people. Absolutely. And of course, can't help but thinking, you know, in terms of collective responsibility and all the things that you've been saying and, and some of the quotes earlier, the uh, reflecting on the, the Martin Niemoller uh, writing, right. of course, first they came for me, you know, talking about, you know, if you, if you think that this isn't your issue, the next one may be. And so that, that collective responsibility. So uh, just one more question and then we're gonna wrap up and, and you already actually mentioned one, uh, one suggested reading. Um, are there any other uh, essential readings that, that you would recommend to, to broaden understanding of, uh, of what we're dealing with today? Oh, well, there, there, there are really many too many. So um, I, I have an obligation to suggest that you read some Heschel. Uh, moral grandeur and spiritual um, accountability um, or anything else. Um, da dabble in some of the contemporary teachings who are speaking to this issue. In terms of what else is being written and said right now, as I think you mostly know if you're on this webinar, a huge explosion of books about race and racism. Um, I suspect that the most serious and, and enduring one is gonna be cast. So Isabel Wilkerson's book about caste, issues of caste and race, about some of the ways and connections that she makes between um, uh, caste divisions in, um, in Germany, actually in India and in um, the United States, um, trying to do a better job of understanding the roots of how we got here for sure. Um, I guess I'm trying to, I would read, um, I, I have to admit, I don't know what form it's in now, but the 1619 Project. So the piece of work that the New York Times did about two years ago or a year ago, which was called the 1619 Project, that being the first date that um, um, slaves um, came to the United States. But there were lots of, the advantage of the 1619 Project um, is that it's short. If you were gonna be in a, I mean, not short, but it's got lots of different pieces and tells the history. Um, and I guess um, one, one um, I just was seeing a wonderful note from Mark Berkson. See, I told people who were on here who I knew to tell me they were on. And so, hello, Rabbi Berkson. Um, so, um, um, what I want to say, Molly, is I don't think this work. I think this, the following recommendation is best um, done in a group. Um, we, I'm part of a group right now that is meeting and talking about how to bring some of this back to our own congregations. But I would urge you to, to download, must be about four years old now, the, the Case for Reparations by Ta-Nehisi Coates. It was an article. He's written some great books. But it was an article in the um, Atlantic several years ago, probably about 40 pages, the case for reparations. And, um, and think about it. And that, by the way, goes directly to this issue of guilty or responsible. So just a quick note, maybe all of you know this, but if your family has been in the um, United States, wherever you came from, for a couple of generations, it's quite possible that some um, ancestor of yours, grandparent, uncle, whatever, um, fought in the Second World War and um, was um, helped by um, um, 
by coming back from the war and being able to get a federal housing assistance. And we all know that if you own property or a house, it often, not always, but it often appreciates in value and creates a source of wealth for you and your families. But the program that the United States ran after a war in which many people of color fought to keep me safe, um, the federal housing program discriminated against black people. So, you know, talk, sit with that idea for a while. You can tell me that you didn't do it. It goes directly to the quote I was giving you. You didn't do it. You weren't around then. You didn't create that policy. It's too bad. You hope it's no longer the policy. Or you can say, is there something I should do about this? Look up the story, and I don't know what the article is, but look up the story of Georgetown University in Washington. Georgetown discovered, again, in the last five years, that part of the wealth of their university and the capacity to build their first buildings came because they had slaves that they sold. And they've created a reparations program in which they have literally looked for the descendants of the slaves that they sold and made college available to them. And they've done a lot of other things, but that's an example of you know, guilt, responsibility. The question is what more could we, each of us and all of us be doing to create greater equity? And that's, uh, I, I think a, a, good, a good statement to end on here. Um, we, uh, Cassie, thank you, put up the, the link, letting people know that you can buy uh, CAST um, from JMM online. Um, the, yes, we will be sending out Ruth's quotes and um, we can certainly, you know, recap the suggested readings or if there's other things that uh, Ruth wants to pass along after we uh, end this evening, we can do that as well. So Ruth, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, for sharing your knowledge, for sharing your insights. Um, and uh, I, I think we all, you know, as you said at the top of this program, are, are trying to wrap our hands around so many emotions and so many thoughts. And so sitting with that in terms of thinking of how we can act and move forward is, uh, is a very good suggestion. So thank you for being with us. Um, I would like to just mention a couple of upcoming programs. Um, continuing our Global Museum Passport Virtual Home Edition series, we're going to be traveling to uh, Yemen with the Sephardi, excuse me, with the Institute of Jewish Experience uh, to look at the Sephardi community. And of course, uh, Yemen has had an ongoing civil war, um, lots of strife there. It'll be very interesting to look at the uh, history there of the global Jewish community. Um, also, uh, on a little bit of a, a lighter note, uh, in addition to our Designing Justice, ex Justice exhibit, we have uh, Shakespeare's in the Alley, a tribute to Bob Dylan, and kind of looking to wrap that up as both of those exhibits are closing at the end of the month, we have Trapper Shep doing an acoustic tribute to Bob Dylan. Um, that's on Tuesday, January 19th. The Global Passport Program on Monday, January 11th. Uh, information on our website. So please check that out. And uh, if you can join us, we encourage you to do so. Thank you again to those who have donated, uh, those who are able to do so to help us to continue to bring these important programs, speakers to our Milwaukee and much greater community now uh, with, all, with so much of the virtual content. So thank you again to Ruth. Thank you everyone for being here. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully soon, and if not, on another screen. So a happy, healthy, and much better new year to everyone. Thank you.